Hello, everybody. Welcome to this Social Science Forum event. I'm David Hoffman, the director of UMBC's Center for Democracy and Civic Life. I have the honor of introducing our speaker, Harry Boyd. But before I do, I want to acknowledge that this event has been put together by a whole lot of UMBC centers and departments in collaboration. So I want to acknowledge them. In addition to the Center for Democracy and Civic Life, this event is sponsored by the Center for Social Science Research, the Sondheim Scholars Program, the Department of Residential Life, the School of Public Policy, the Shriver Center, the Language Literacy and Culture Program, the Department of Political Science, the Sherman Scholars Program, and UMBC's Wisdom Council, its retired faculty and staff who are continuing to contribute to UMBC. So Harry Boyd is the Senior Scholar for Public Work Philosophy at Augsburg University in Minneapolis. And I think it's also fair to say he's the Senior Scholar for Public Work Philosophy, period. Harry was a field secretary in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Martin Luther King's organization in the 1960s. And from that time, he's been a keen observer and increasingly influential theorist of democracy, civic life, and community organizing. He's a public intellectual and an organizer. He's the author of nine books, hundreds of other publications, and he's the founder of the Public Achievement Program, an international program where college students coach elementary and middle school students to identify issues and problems in their communities and pull together the resources to address them. And most recently is the founder of the Public Work Academy, which is bringing the public work philosophy, the idea that ordinary people in everyday settings, in their neighborhoods, in their workplaces, can build power together, solve problems, create new resources, bringing those ideas to communities in the United States and abroad. Harry's been a very influential figure in my life and career. Um, I met him a little more, a little less than 20 years ago. I had been a corporate litigator and was deeply unfulfilled by that career. I wanted to contribute to some greater good and was not seeing a way to do that in that job. I felt disconnected and I felt like um, my work didn't matter. And I changed careers, got a job as a community organizer, did that for a number of years, and was more connected to public purposes. It felt like the work mattered, but the pattern that I saw was there were times in that work where things clicked, where the relationships that I had with the people that I was working with trying to organize in neighborhoods to address problems relating to poverty felt right, and people had a sense of possibility and they saw that they could build things together and there was energy, um, a sense of hope. And then at other times it felt like I was applying the techniques of organizing, but it was going through the motions. Things didn't feel authentic. It felt a little manipulative and inorganic. People didn't feel the same kind of energy and I didn't have words for any of that. And so I had gone through school trying to build a law school resume. For the first time I went back and started to look at scholarly literature trying to answer a question in my life. What is this thing? What is happening? Why is it that in some settings and contexts, people can build real power and in others it falls flat? And I discovered Harry's work. And it started to give me the language. And so I, I got a fellowship that allowed me to choose an organization anywhere in the United States. It was supposed to be a nonprofit. I talked them into letting me do this with a university uh, agency um, to travel and to shadow a leader for a week. And so I reached out to Harry and said, he was in Minneapolis, I was in San Diego. I said, I would like to spend a week with you learning about the things that you're doing in your Center for Democracy and Citizenship. And Harry probably thought that was a strange request, <laughs> um, partly because it was November and I was losing about 60 degrees by making the trip. Um, but he, he said yes, and I went and told him my life story and had him reflect it back at me in ways that were really empowering and helped me to understand my own interests, gave me the language to name the things that I actually wanted to contribute to the world and the moments that felt right versus the moments that felt wrong, uh, and showed me the work that he was doing in Minneapolis and St. Paul with these schools, these college students going out to coach much younger uh, individuals and help them form communities and solve problems. So that changed the direction of my life. It was a couple of years later, this was in um, November 2000, so the headlines were dominated that week by um, George W. Bush and Al Gore and who was going to be the president. 
a couple of years after that, I came to UMBC to keep asking these questions and digging deeper. And if you've experienced the Breaking Ground Initiative, the Strive Immersive Student Leadership Retreat, if you've been in the Student Government Association and experienced the way that they think about their role on campus, um, if you've taken courses in the Honors College called Talking Democracy, or this semester, Be Your Best Self in Real Life, all of that reflects Harry's influence. So Harry has made his mark on the way that a lot of people at UMBC think about the possibilities for civic engagement. So I am so proud to be able to welcome him here to talk about the challenges in our national life today and the way to think about the connection between work and engagement. So welcome Harry Boyd. Can you hear? Thank you, David. That was a, that was a wonderful introduction and re, re, reminds recalls really important experiences over the years. Um, I want to thank David and Romy Hubler for putting this together. And um, I should say I've been very impressed with the political organizing that went into creating the new Center for Democracy and Civic Life. So I want to give a round of applause to that center. I think it holds real potential to be a major force in the democracy movement in higher education and beyond. Um, so I'm delighted to be here. I also want to thank the co-sponsors of this event. I want to note that my wife, Mari Strum, is, who's the co-founder of the Public Work Academy and a South African democracy educator for many years has joined us. And our daughter, uh, Jay, who's just become a chief in the Coast Guard and went to uh, a very interesting leadership academy that had some resemblance to the kind of leadership you all are working on. Um, so we're in trouble as a society. Uh, oh, by the way, how many people were uh, in our event last night in the community? That's what I, th I saw some students. Um, that was a terrific conversation. That was a really intense conversation. I'll come back to it a couple of times. But I think it really is on the topic we want to talk about today. How can we reverse the negative trends towards greater and greater division, prejudices, expressions of hatred, kind of tribal identities, and pervasive disempowerment? And I'm going to take that on through the prism of work. How do we reclaim the public purpose of work and the dignity of work of every kind. Now, it's not an easy task. I do believe that UMBC is positioned to take real leadership on the question, and I'll explain why I think that's true. Even the diversity of sponsors and the diversity of UMBC in terms of fields and backgrounds and cultures um, point to what will be crucial, which is we need to create in many settings, but higher education is key, ways for people to interact on a sustained basis across their differences and to create what I would call learning cultures that not are simply are about head knowledge, but about the capacities to act. What's called here sometimes civic agency. One can also call it empowerment. One can also call it civic muscle. They're different languages. But it's the capacity to act across our differences in ways that draw on those differences and don't simply make them the problem. Um, I thought the discussion last night also was a very powerful, intense evidence of students interested in thinking about the careers they're going to have. So let me just ask, the students here, are you all thinking about what kind of careers you're going to have? Are you worried about that? in any way. Do you think about, can I have a job with meaning and purpose and impact? Is that a question? Um, it's a very big question for higher education students across the country. In fact, in the New York Times on last Sunday, there was an article called One Way to Make College Meaningful. Um, it was about colleges that uh, focus on what's called vocation, which is a term out of religious traditions, which, which means a calling. And it shows that unknown colleges who have a vocational focus where students explore their careers and the purposes for going into fields 
are being much more successful than a lot of other colleges, even colleges that are in the cohort that are supposedly endangered. They're highly successful in graduating students and seeing graduation and uh, attendance and admissions increase. So the topic is on the table, and you could really see it last night. Um, so this is my argument, that work is becoming degraded and losing its purpose um, for a different reason than people normally talk about the problems and doubt and challenges of democracy. First of all, I should say for students, democracy, in my view, that I learned in the Civil Rights Movement is not mainly elections. That's shrunk. A lot of our ideas have shrunk. Democracy is a way of life which we build in all sorts of settings through our individual and collective work. And work is being degraded and democracy is shrunk because we live in a technological revolution um, that is being driven not by human purposes of our collective welfare, but by narrow purposes um, in the service of what's called the efficiency principle of doing things faster and faster and cheaper and cheaper to get to a point which is really never discussed. So I'll give a couple of examples, politics and education. I also could easily describe business. I mean the replacement of local um, stores and communities across the country with the giant box stores is a good example. The hollowing out of downtowns, um, the degradation of work, the stagnation of pay, but I want to talk about uh, politics and education. But this technological revolution, or what's called artificial intelligence and big data, um, are seen increasingly as a danger. So nine scientists in Scientific American a couple of years ago wrote an article that was prophetic, entitled, Will Democracy Survive Big Data and Artificial Intelligence? I'm going to draw on that in setting up the problem, and then I'm going to go on to describe why I think higher education and universities like UMBC really will play a crucial role in turning that around. Now, the problem with uh, the spread of artificial intelligence and big data and technological systems which disempower us is that it's hard kind of power to name. We have a colleague in a field called Civic Studies, Peter Levine, who says, precisely because the power of technology is soft, imperceptible, cheap, and ubiquitous, which means all over the place, it's hard to resist. Our education um, is partly the cause of these problems. The technological revolution, also without too much discussion of what its purpose is and what it's going for, and also in training people in narrow ways that are kind of outside experts. I'll discuss that more. But rather than broad community-minded professionals and leaders, people who think narrowly about their work, think about the particular discipline. So my argument today begins with this danger. And then I describe ways I think UMBC can be a crucial source of change. So the first topic is dehumanization soft and hard, or hard and soft. <coughs> Let me start with a poem entitled Touch by an anti-apartheid activist in South Africa about his experience in jail in the 1960s. It captures the hard forms of dehumanization that were characteristic of apartheid, not only in jail but in every aspect of life and I should say that also characterized the South that I grew up in under segregation. It was sent to me by Karen Strum, my South African sister and Mari's sister, via the social media, what's up? There are very positive uses for technology when they are in the service of communication. Here's a selection from Hugh Lewin, the anti-apartheid activist. 
When I get out, I am going to ask someone to touch me very gently, please, and slowly. I want to learn, again, how life feels. For seven years, this is time in prison, I've learned the meaning of untouchable. I can count the things that touched me. One, fists. Fierce, mad fists, beating, beating till I remember screaming, don't touch me, please don't touch me. Two, pause. Every day, padding pause, searching pause, arms up, shows off, legs apart, heavy, indifferent, probing away all privacy. He ends with a glimmer of hope about life behind the, beyond the prison and actually life beyond apartheid, although it would take decades to achieve. I want to be touched again. I want to feel alive again. So that's hard forms of dehumanization and domination. We live in a world where they're softer and more pervasive and harder to name, but they are no less present. The poem reminds me of David Hoffman's dissertation, Becoming Real. If you haven't seen it, I'd suggest you get it. It's great. It's about a UMBC. Um, it's a study of, well, based on interviews with students who helped birth the civic movement at UMBC. They give a vivid account of forms of manipulation and dehumanization that many young people feel today. They also describe their experiences of becoming real as they develop a sense of empowerment and the sense of themselves as agents of change. David describes what Max Weber called iron cages formed by technical reason, which thinks about the efficiency of means but not the purpose of the um, activity. It's a distinctive kind of imprisonment in the 21st century. Looking back at their experiences, students saw earlier experiences as highly scripted and unreal, soft kinds of dehumanization. Even peers seemed to be role-playing. Yasmin Karimian, who some of you may know, led the transformation of the student government uh, seven or eight years ago. Um, said it this way, I grew up in a society that everything I did wasn't real. Many of you will remember her leadership in organizing. The students describe patterns of interaction that are multiplying. And the big data and algorithms and digital revolution are increasing the problem. Sue Halpern in the New York Review of Books describes the datification of everything leaves behind what can't be quantified. It relies on proxies to squash into um, forms vastly complex realities with the biases of the programmers and the elites and the technocratic experts written in. Today, algorithms are used to predict who will commit a crime, to influence sentencing, to determine hiring in jobs, and to determine one's credit rating. Artificial intelligence and digital technology and social media have a lot of potential benefits. My sister is sending the poem as one example. But when the revolution is driven by the purpose of th getting things faster and faster to get to places we haven't really agreed should be our goals, the, the consequences can be very destructive. Um, electoral politics, and I would say the public political culture is a case in port. This is the way the Scientific American article puts it. If our judgments and our decisions are predetermined by algorithms, this leads to a brainwashing of the people. Collective intelligence, our capacities to think and act together depend on diversity. Pluralism and participation are not 
concessions to citizens, but actually the foundations of thriving societies, that are free societies. They observe, in contrast, algorithms today know pretty well what we do, what we think, how we feel, possibly even better than ourselves and our friends. We are being remotely controlled in invisible ways more successfully than ever. And the dynamics are dangerous. A centralized system of technocratic control, they argue, using a super intelligent information system would result in a new kind of dictatorship. So making it concrete and also beyond partisan divisions. It's not hard to see how Donald Trump's use of social media through tweets inflames divisions and prejudices um, and whips up people's emotion, right? It's fed by the technological revolution. But it's important to realize that these are actually the culmination of decades old trends. They're not simply Donald Trump's tweets. So what's happened is uh, technology has allowed um, soundbite messages to dominate in public discourse is that we've seen increasingly a us versus them politics, a good versus evil politics, what can be called a Manichaean politics. Why is that? Because hatred is a very cheap and easy emotion to manipulate. And the technological revolution accelerates that process. Parallel things are happening in education. Kathy O'Neill begins her book, Weapons of Math, M-A-T-H, Destruction, with the story of an elementary school teacher, Sarah Wasaki, in Washington. She got great reviews from parents and her peers and the principal, and she received a termination notice at the end of the school year. This is because her score on the algorithm that the school system was using to evaluate outweighed any human feedback she was getting. It was developed by Mathematica Policy Research. No one knows why. It could have been that they compared the test results of her students to their scores the year before when others were teaching them. It could have been that teachers doctored the test results. It could be that several of her students had a really bad day when they took the test. And the small numbers could radically skew her score. No one knows. As O'Neill writes, such algorithms are secret. They come like verdict, verdicts handed down from algorithm, algorithmic gods. And of course, um, this happens in higher education. Not long ago, I was at Lone Star Community College in Houston, Texas, and the faculty were worried about outcome measures um, dictated by uh, quality improvement experts without any of their participation. The receptionist in the student union was worried about losing her job to a robot. In South Africa, where we live part of the year, the, the measures of success for faculty have become more and more narrowed. So now they've narrowed down to publication in ranked peer-reviewed journal articles. And what you do in the local communities in South Africa really have no impact on your standing. In 1902, Jane Addams warned that such technocratic politics designed by outsiders, experts, uh, have enormous consequences for society. She said, none of us can stand apart. Our, feared, our feet are mired in the same soil. Our lungs breathe the same air. And she compared, actually, the corrupt ward boss who she was in, Jane Adams was a great settlement house leader in Chicago working with new immigrants. Um, she said, the ward boss who we're in constant battle with was more democratic than outside experts who try to fix the people from outside the community. And the technological revolution gives detached experts more and more control. As Albert Dejure, the political theorist, has put it, today along with the blustering autocrats who are obvious foes of democracy, there is a 
a more subtle pattern, a way of thinking about other people and about politics and about policy, which privileges distance, information, cool professionalism, not relationships and local and cultural knowledge. Where the autocrat threatens democracy loudly, cages dissidents, investigates critics, talks about fake news, and journalism is the enemy of the people, the technocrat th threatens it quietly creating the impression that the big problems facing society can only be solved by outside experts. So it undermines people's confidence in themselves. So higher education, which trains professionals these days in narrow ways and drives a good deal of the technological revolution, is also crucial to overcoming the dangers. That's my argument. And here are three ways it can do so, and they all are have some suggestion of, of uh, what's happening at UMBC and what happened in the conversation um, last night. First of all, um, there's a possibility of a different kind of politics that connects people across the differences and allows them to work through tensions and conflicts, doesn't divide them as us and against them. Um, secondly, higher education is going to have to be the site of rethinking the nature of work to recover a sense of the public purpose and dignity of work of every kind. This is a challenge. We had a dis long discussion at lunch today. This is not an easy thing, but it's a crucial thing. And thirdly, uh, we have to think about civic capacity as not simply developed among small groups and individuals, but on a community-wide basis. And I'll give a story at the end of a, of a community which has had that experience. And, um, UMBC can also be likened to a community. I grew up in the American South, as David said. Uh, it was a place full of fear and fatalism and fury and division and hatred, much like Lewin, South Africa. I mean, putting yourself back into that world, um, my friends and teachers in the white community were afraid to even raise the question of segregation. Not because they necessarily agreed with the segregation, but because they were worried for their safety. My parents were among a handful of European Americans in Atlanta, Georgia, who were outspoken critics of Jim Crow. There are many parallels with today. People are sometimes afraid to have Thanksgiving dinner with family members of a different political persuasion. According to a group that's seeking to depolarize the country, Better Angels, 90% of Republicans have a very unfavorable view of Democrats, and 89% of Democrats have a very unfavorable view of Republicans. More than 40% of Americans do not want their children to marry somebody of another party, political party. That's increasingly bitter divides that are inflamed by technological algorithms and manipulation. In the 1960s, the Civil War was brewing again in the South over desegregation. Today, the social fabric is unraveling that feed the bitter divisions. People trust each other less. Friendship circles have narrowed. Robert Putnam described the decline of social relations in his book, Bowling Alone. Since then, the number of people who report being lonely has skyrocketed even more. Young people under 35 who are the most prolific social media users are often those who feel most alone. And new technologies, according to research, can contribute. If you use Facebook as a substitute for making friends rather than a supplement for friends, it can increase the loneliness. But in the civil rights movement, I saw how nonviolence could transform human relationships. Nonviolence was a kind of politics, not simply civil disobedience or mass marches or sit-ins. Let me call attention to a splendid uh, new book, which has a chapter by Karuna Mantena, 
called The Theory and Practice of Nonviolent Politics. This is a book on Martin Luther King. It's the first book like this. I mean, you'd think everybody knows Martin Luther King, right? This is the first book on King as really a serious political philosopher in the world who had enormous impact. Now, I should say, having worked for SCLC, I know actually King was not alone. He was actually interactive, part of an intellectual, vibrant community of organizers and thinkers. The book is called To Shape a New World, Essays on the Political Philosophy of Martin Luther King. It's just out from Harvard University Press. It's a very important look at nonviolence as a different kind of politics. And I was taught this kind of politics by people like Dorothy Cotton, director of the Citizenship Schools for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Oliver Harvey, a janitor at Duke, who led a campaign organizing the maids and janitors, built around the dignity and importance of their work. And Bayard Rustin, organizer of the 1963 March on Washington. This was the heart of the political lesson that they all conveyed. The most effective way to make change is not to demonize or uh, humiliate or degrade your opponents, but to try to figure out where they're coming from. Try to understand where they're coming from. It doesn't, you don't mean, it's not a love in. You don't have to like them. But understanding where your opponents are coming from is the most important political um, practice for making change. So a couple of examples. Oliver Harvey, the janitor I was talking about, framed the campaign um, as uh, about the importance of the maids and janitors and non-academic staff at Duke contributing more fully to the educational mission of Duke University. It was not an attack on Duke University. It was saying, if we are recognized as doing important, vital, dignified work in terms of salary, in terms of respect, in terms of working conditions, it will vastly increase the educational culture and possibilities of Duke. And that message had a transformative impact on the whole student body over the four years I was at Duke. Amazing impact. Took a while, wasn't instant, but it really did speak to something deep. This is something we talked about last night. Um, how many people here have heard of Bayard Rustin? A few. So Bayard Rustin was the most important political theorist and practitioner, philosopher in the civil rights movement. And the reason most of you haven't heard about him is because he was gay. He had been in the youth, communist youth organization in the 1930s. He was black and he was a, a Quaker. He was nonviolent. He taught King nonviolence and he also his, was his most important political advisor. And Bayard Rustin was the was the organizer of the March on Washington, where King gave his famous speech, I Have a Dream. But we talked last night with, uh, in the student discussion about how few people know the way Bayard Rustin framed the march was not as a protest. How many have heard of the March on Washington as a protest? I mean, it's what it's normally portrayed as, right? It was not a protest. Bayard Rustin framed it in terms of this strategy. He said, about a third of the country is with us in the civil rights movement. A third of the country is, are at this point diehard opponents, which at that point actually included most of my extended family in the South. Um, and that leaves 35, 40% of the country which is in the middle. And their issue is not civil rights. We can't guilt them into having our issue but on the other hand, we are not going to make any deep change in the country without support from the middle of America. So the March on Washington was seen as a way to win over the middle. And that was not only King's speech, which articulated that brilliantly, I have a dream, didn't come out of the air, it came out of that strategy, but it also was reflected in the dignity and the, and the, um, the spirit of the marchers who showed a tremendous amount of discipline and nonviolence and self-respect and commanded the attention of the world. So 
I learned this politics um, and awakening democracy. This book has many stories. And one of the major stories is at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Kailash Ramu and David Hoffman wrote for the Baltimore Sun several years ago. Given the rancorous tone of current public debate and gridlock, college students are understandably skeptical about politics. This pessimistic view may be the received wisdom, but we see reason for hope. At the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, students are learning to practice a different kind of politics that bridges differences and strengthens communities. They describe many examples. Like one team of Jewish and Muslim students worked with the administration to bring kosher and halal options to the campus cafeteria. Others redesigned spaces to make them more public. Others reduced the school's greenhouse gas emissions across party lines, encouraged healthy lifestyles, sought to boost campus spirit. And the, and the student government um, became a model for the nation for shifting from seeing most students as clients and consumers, to which the student government serviced, to seeing the student government as a site for empowerment and for public work projects. Actually, I should note that um, we had a project that UMBC was one of the pioneers, the founding members of something called the Civic Agency Initiative on colleges and universities. Um, and we had a meeting of about 20 or so universities in the end of 2010 in Washington. Uh, and UMBC brought 17 students, including Yasmin Karumian, who I mentioned before had led the uh, kind of organizing for change in the student government. And the students did a remarkable job of challenging the delegation from the White House. I had worked in the Obama campaign in 2008, so I invited people from the White House. Saying, I thought the slogan of the campaign was, yes, we can. We all were going to be involved. And here it's kind of government doing it. What happened to that message? So that was a really good agitation. <laughs> Um, and the White House actually, not long after that, asked me to create a coalition of higher education for the 150th anniversary of the Morrill Act, which created land-grant colleges in 1862, um, to think about how we could strengthen the public purposes of higher education. So UMBC played a really important role. Um, there are a lot of examples that you know about at UMBC of what I would call a different kind of politics, breaking ground, um, allocating resources, negotiating change. This is what uh, Kailash and <coughs> David say. This is where politics come in, not as a dirty word or power seeking, but as a set of skills everyone can use to find common ground and get things done. I'll come back to our Public Achievement Youth Initiative because it's relevant to see how young people learn how to make change within bureaucratic institutions like schools. It's relevant for um, making change anywhere. But the second key area of higher education, higher education, if it really, on a large scale, takes up a different kind of politics with all of the millions of students, is going to change the understanding of politics in America. It has immense potential power. There's a second question that uh, higher education is really central to, which is the crisis in work. There is a growing sense of crisis in work. Uh, Barack Obama made the point last summer in South Africa. He emphasized the huge transformations that are about to take place in work and also the importance of reclaiming the dignity and purpose of work. He said the pace of change is going to require us to do a fundamental reimagining of our social and political arrangements to protect the dignity that comes with a job. It's not just money that a job provides. It provides dignity and structure and a sense of purpose. There's growing, beginning to be growing recognition that higher education has a crucial role because it's central to workforce preparation and the design of jobs. So this year there's going to begin a, a course at MIT taught by six faculty members collectively interdisciplinary, called Reimagining and Shaping the Future of Work. 
Now, if MIT can do it, UMBC, UMBC can do those, but actually with some added dimensions. But let me describe. The goal of this course, the description says, is to explore the current state of work that impact globalizations and new technologies like AI and robotics are having, and develop plans of action for improving career opportunities. If we take the right actions, it says hopefully, we can shape the future of work in ways that meet the needs of workers, families, and economies and societies. But we have to find out what's happening. So it's based partly on all of the changes that are taking place at work. So a note in our own work. I took the dignity of work that I had learned in the civil rights movement from people like Oliver Harvey and working for Martin Luther King to our work at the Humphrey Institute when I came in 1987. Now the, Humphrey Institute of the University of Minnesota asked me to start a project on democracy and we wanted to take the best organizing experiences I had seen and take them to a larger environments, especially to <coughs> institutions. Like the College of St. Catherine and a nursing home, Augustana and um, schools across the Twin Cities and, and local government. Um, for more than 30 years, first through the University of Minnesota and more recently through Augsburg University, we focused on people developing and promoting and claiming the dignity and public purpose of their work. We call that public work. Public work is work that's collaborative, um, that's full of public purpose, and that makes a public impact. So it can be any kind of job. We call citizen professionals those who learn the skills and work to work collaboratively to change their work sites and their communities into more humane and empowering and purpose-filled settings. And the book is full of examples from classrooms to communities. Um, so it's really about thinking of your work as having larger impact beyond your own self or in your own family. We've worked with policy makers and politicians and teachers and nurses and extension workers and also bankers and therapists and scientists. So this afternoon we talked about, in a lunch, we talked about how higher education itself can be a site for thinking about work in different ways, work of all kinds in different ways, including the work students do and the work staff does and the work faculty does and the work administrators do. Let me give you an example of Denison University. Denison University has worked closely with Dennis Donovan, who was a principal of our first school, St. Bernard School, where public achievement really took root and became the spirit of the school in St. Paul in the 1990s. He's now our master coach based at Augsburg. The student affairs staff at Denison is teaching skills to students of working through their conflicts themselves, rather than stepping in and trying to give therapeutic remedies or enforce the rules. Uh, the democratic mix at Denison is very diverse. It's kind of like UMBC. 40% are underrepresented populations. There are many rural white students. But the potential of a place like Denison, when students learn skills of engaging each other and working through problems together um, is that it's like full of neighborhoods like the residence halls can be rethought as residential neighborhoods where people learn together and can actually figure out how to get along. <coughs> so the student affairs staff has done a really good job of taking that model, that concept of students, residents, um, as neighborhoods and working in a large-scale way with students. So this year, the student affairs staff and the residence halls have done 600, well, in the fall, they did 600 one-on-one -on -one meetings to get to know each student, to get to know who they were and their passions. They taught those skills to students themselves. They facilitated dialogues and discussions about hot-button topic, topics, including race and partisan conflict and the drinking culture and the party culture. So for example, during the Kavanaugh hearings, when there was so much conflict around America, a group of students organized 
<coughs> a meeting that included um, violence against women activists and feminists, and they invited fraternity leaders to that meeting. It wasn't speaking to the choir, it's engaging people across differences. And the students came up with a whole series of ideas that they began to organize around, and they've continued to organize around, about what to do about the problems of party culture and uh, date rape and really tough issues. And they've seen significant changes. That's students learning how to work on problems themselves. Um, Ivy Distel, a student leader says in the aftermath of 2016 there was a lot of student protests but there was not relationship building outside of our own like-minded groups. But the work over the last couple of years in the residence halls has helped break students out of their bubbles. That's how she puts it. They show that higher education can be a place where we learn how to deal with people who are different. But that comes from what we would call the student affairs staff creating spaces and training for students. So they become themselves citizen professionals, different kind of professionals in their own work. It's not simply students on their own, it's actually students in partnership with student affairs staff. So finally, we need to see significant scale um, capacity in communities that learn how to work across differences beyond particular issues, beyond particular institutions. Um, I would say this is the limit of the MIT course. So the MIT course has important aspirations. It says it's going to uncover what's gone wrong in order to figure out solutions. We'll look at how technology is impacting industries and transforming the nature of work. And we'll explore how society, we as a society, can shape and catalyze technologies in ways that augment human work rather than replace it. It's a wonderful vision. They say that students are going to develop their own personal narratives and think about their own careers. There's a limit to it, though. In fact, uh, Yasmin was at our luncheon meeting today, and she said, it's, it's very good to have civic engagement experiences in, in college. And then what happens when you get out into the real world? You can be like a, a cold bath. If you don't have the political knowledge to make change. So there's another step beyond really rich civic engagement or civic agency and experiences in college. It's actually how to learn um, as whole communities the skills of making change. And I think here higher education can learn from other places. So I'm going to finish with a story of Eau Claire, Wisconsin. The Eau Claire story began in 2007 and really actually stretched back into the 90s. Uh, the, the city manager, Mike Huggins, had become convinced that uh, we need a different model of city manager for the 21st century who is not a fixer, who doesn't have the solutions, who doesn't pretend to know the answers to a community's problems, but is able to actually catalyze and bring in a variety of different kinds of groups. He was really excited about the idea of a Pub, uh, public city manager as a citizen city manager. He loved that idea. And he'd seen examples in our networks. And also he'd been inspired by the stories of the civil rights movement from people like Dorothy Cotton, my mentor, who was the boss of the citizenship schools. So in 2007, cutbacks in state contribution and increases in costs resulted in a lot of changes. There were larger school sizes. There was less revenue for social services. But Mike saw it as an opportunity, not simply a danger. So he brought together a remarkably diverse group which had never actually talked to each other to get a sense of where the community was going and what to do. Higher education played a role. The community college and the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire were part of the mix. So were city government. So was the face community. So was a community organization called Jonah, a broad-based organization fighting for justice and uh, for poor people. The Chamber of Commerce, leaders from the Hmong community, from the African American community, trade unions. So that was a diversity that's really rare. Uh, but they didn't simply have a chat. They talked about what we can do. They developed priorities. 
and they created a citizen group called Clear Vision with the goal of engaging the community for the common good. So they began to develop work on a variety of issues, um, letting people choose what kind of issues they wanted to work on. And at the same time, they really began an intensive process of building civic skills. So like, how do you work with somebody of a different political party or a different racial or cultural background or a different economic background? Harvard University's Innovation in Government awarded Clear Vision $10,000 for its work. And it said what was really distinctive and unique about Clear Vision is its inclusive qualities. It's also its core concepts like a different kind of politics and public work. And it's very intensive, sustained focus on developing skills. Mike Huggins estimates that thousands, several thousand people have learned basic organizing skills, like having a meeting with somebody you don't know, finding out what their interests are, like doing power, what we call power mapping, figuring out what kind of power is around a particular issue, like doing a sustained process of reflection on how can we learn from mistakes rather than be terrified of mistakes? How can we uh, develop a discipline and a habit of reflection? So they're very dramatic examples of outcomes. A homeless shelter that some ex-convicts led in organizing. A $45 million performing arts center on the bank of the Eau Claire River. $35 million residential and economic development project. The town has really come to life. Uh, public art through the cities, community gardens. There's also impact on the formal political system. So the new city council this year has, um, led by Catherine Emanuel, a young Latina leader, who says involvement in Clear Vision changed her life. She never imagined she could be at the same table with bankers and politicians and leaders. Um, they adopted what's called participatory budgeting, a really far-ranging reform which gives control over part of the budget to the community. So people vote on projects that, are com that the community comes up with. Um, she sees many possibilities. Will the chamber be a place to hang art from youth? Will there be welcome signs in Hmong and Spanish? Will there be tables that people can come in. How can the city council chambers become a citizen site? And there have also been changes in institutions. So Vicki Hain, who was the vice president for uh, marketing of the largest financial institution in the region called the Royal Credit Union, uh, was involved from the very beginning. And she says, clear vision and being involved has changed what we do. So rather than come in a community, 42 communities they have branches in, rather than come in and announce our project, we actually interact with the community. So we, for example, in Eau Claire itself, they were gonna do a, a big new building on the riverbank and the neighborhood said, well, you're gonna deny us access to the river. So they actually changed their whole plan. They moved it back um, and now they um, have a park in front of it. She says that we've, we've, that's become our approach in interacting with communities across Western Wisconsin. And Catherine Emanuel, who was the first uh, single parent on welfare at the beginning of Clear Vision, is now the regional director of the cooperative extension system with a staff of 21. And she says, we use these kind of organizing skills in everything we do with the communities and help people develop the capacities to act. So that is scale. And it also impacts people's ability to imagine. Um, there's now a new visioning process that's gone back out to the whole community, thousands of people, to get input on what the city should look like in 2030 and 2040. And um, they've become very interested in the concept of Eau Claire as incubating and developing a, what, a new civic covenant where we learn to work across our differences to build a healthy community, and they see it as a potential model for the nation. So to conclude, well, I would say Vicki also is, is very eloquent about what she sees as a consequence. So we've seen a lot of changes in institutions and projects, she says, but the most important change is that there's been a change in mindset. At the time we began, everyone blamed government if things didn't get done. 
People said nothing happened because the government is so slow. Clear vision has opened eyes. It's not about relying on or blaming government. It's about taking responsibility and ownership ourselves as citizens and believe if change is going to come, we are the ones we've been waiting for. By the way, that's an old freedom song that Dorothy Cotton used to sing. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Nobody else gonna rescue us. We are the ones we've been waiting for. So it's a shift in mindset. Right? The political theorist Melvin Rogers recently argued in the Boston Review, democracy's survival depends on a set of habits, a culture to sustain it. Democracy is only as strong as the men and women who inhabit it and create it. It's not a system of formal institutions in the, in the final analysis. And I would say in Eau Claire and signs in UMBC, um, strong citizens are developing who can take on problems like the polarization and the divisions and the crisis of work and the fragmentation of communities and the hopelessness people feel. So I want to wish you well. We're on a journey with you. We're delighted to be involved in your um, possibilities. Thank you. Okay, we're going to I'm going to sit over there. Um, and this is the time to come up and ask any questions that you might have for Gary. Um, any clarifications that you would want to Or any comments. Or any comments. I mean, right? this um, so uh, feel free to, to come on over and ask any questions. I'm going to sit down. <clears throat> you can come up where you could actually speak loudly from your seat. Yeah. Hi. Um, hey, man. It's good to see you again. Hi. Hi. I'm Jordan. Um, so I have a question. Um, I'm really interested in knowing what you think the connection between this idea of um, like algorithms and artificial intelligence is like starting to like, you know, damage like the future and stuff like that or like how we think about ourselves. I'm kind of interested in knowing where you think the conversation can start between those who are actually making these algorithms and the companies who are paying people to make these algorithms and the people who are concerned about those topics? Um, well, that's why I concluded with a community-wide story. I think it's very hard to do it, you know, one institution at a time. Um, I don't think business leaders have necessarily thought about it very much. I mean, it's kind of taken for granted. It's technology somehow has a life of its own, but actually that's not true. Um, but one of the key things, I, we were talking to the Obama Foundation the other day, one of the key things is, is finding and encouraging businesses to have a bottom line that's much more than simply accountability to shareholders. Because if you have accountability to shareholders, technology is going to be driven by maximizing profit. If we develop policies and practices and a culture, a normative culture, of saying businesses are a lot more than simply shareholder profit. They're also in communities. They affect the lives of working people and families. If we really begin to institutionalize that idea then we'll think about technology and its uses in a very different way. Does that make sense? Is a, is a starting point to talk about? Yeah. 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 I'm interested in what the students think about this Bayard Rustin point that we better win over the middle if we're going to make any change. Because it's not, we talked about this last night, it's not the way people normally think about making change. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Zuriel. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. I was trying to resurface a question I have regarding that uh, during your talk, which is that you've given us pointers and evidence as to how we can 
make politics cleaner. Um, examples can be Center of Democracies here at UMBC and other universities as well. But the pursuit of winning the middle, to win something, doesn't always, like, when there's an applied winner, there always seems to be an applied loser. And losing always sounds a little bit dirty. And so I'm curious, how do we go about, in your mind, winning the middle without having that be a dirty losing process for another group? Well, that, that's a really good question. So public work involves elections and issue campaigns. Um, that's one dimension. It's not the only dimension. But when, when one thinks about winning the middle, I mean, it is the great strength of the civil rights movement. They won middle America. In Minnesota in 2012, there was a, a campaign called United Fam uh, Un uh, Minnesotans United for All Families, which was against a constitutional amendment which would have banned same-sex marriages. And for the first time, they went back to that older idea of winning over the middle. So rather than demonizing the opposition, or people who were worried about same-sex marriages, for the first time, after 30 state fights, they ask, what are your concerns? I mean, one would think it would be a natural thing, but 30, 30 campaigns, every one of which had lost on the same-sex marriage side, um, had just assumed that the other side were bigoted, so why do we have to ask them anything? Um, so actually, but asking introduced a whole other dimension, which is people had worries about marriage, so they said, Marriage is so good, everybody should have the right to be married. And then they had, instead of canvas calls where you're attacking the other side, they actually engaged millions of, uh, more than a million people in conversations in the state. And that was a very dramatic story of winning over the middle. But public work has also other aspects. So it's not only campaigns like that. Um, it's also about building things together that everybody shares. So the um, UMBC student agency work has had campaigns to decide what would be a good public work project, uh, public spaces, gardens, and so forth, which everybody can benefit from. I would say the, the Eau Claire story <coughs> is full of stories that actually most everybody in the community can benefit from, like the Performing Arts Center and the public gardens and the public art. So I would say it's not an either or thing. Does that make sense? I'm having a hard time here. Oh, so maybe um, you can either stand up or come over. But you've got to project. Okay. Um, can you explain the win in the middle concept relative to uh, focusing on the meeting versus focusing on the meeting? Uh, focus on the what? Focusing on like, achieving the meaning rather than efficacy. Yeah, no, that's important. I think if, well, so one of the wisest women I knew in the movement was a woman named Thelma Craig, who was. Um, the leader of the movement in southern Alabama. She said you can win particular fights by winning over the middle, but actually the most important thing is creating different meaning and different story. And she said to do that we have to aim not at getting 50.1%, but like 80% to buy into a different story about where we're going to be. Um, so I think if one thinks about, and so it's, it's an important way to think of why Martin Luther King gave the I Have a Dream speech. It didn't come out of the blue. It wasn't his all-time philosophy. He gave a very different speech in Memphis in 1968 about the dignity of work. It sounded much more radical, but he hadn't changed. He was talking to particular audiences, and he was giving a different vision of America than a nation riven by conflict and segregation and, and uh, racism. So that, that was actually about meaning. I think actually you're, it's a very good point that when you think about Reaching a lot larger audience, you're not thinking about us versus them. You're thinking about a different kind of story. Yeah, Tommy. Uh, so one of the points that stood out to me um, is how you talked about um, how I kind of felt in the capacity to work and bridge across difference. Um, and I guess like I'm wondering, because I see that point and hear that point, but I'm wondering. Um, how that differs in communities that are not don't have a lot of diversity, um, and what kind of work can be done in those communities to kind of tackle that issue of if it's kind of everyone's feeling the same way about it. Well, that's a good question. Um, so, 
it involves what we would call a civic organizing approach. Um, I was saying last night you were there, um, that whenever you go into any community, um, an organizing approach, rather than mobilizing us against them, um, an organizing approach is not to list all the things you're, you think are wrong with the community. <laughs> And this applies to a workplace as well as, uh, you can think about a workplace as a community as well as a geographic community. Uh, you just get to know the community. And you get to know its strengths and its um, values and its histories and its people, its conflicts and its things that it's ashamed of and things it's uh, proud of. And you build from there. I have a, a former student, Ben Fink, who got his PhD in cultural studies from the University of Minnesota who really is a good example of that. So Ben, a liberal Jewish guy from East Coast, um, for the last three years has been working in um, a county in West Virginia which voted 70% for Trump. He wrote a very good piece that you can get on the internet called Building Democracy in Trump Country. He read it. So, you know, he just introduced people to different kinds of folks and different kinds of experiences and he found that actually people, when they get to know you, are quite open to all sorts of difference. They're actually m more tolerant in that area than in the Twin Cities where he was in the liberal professional graduate student world, but people were very judgmental. Whereas in Letcher County, they were pretty open once they got to know you. So in his experience, what, you, what people needed was concrete human interaction. And that has been an, an important organizing principle. But I would also say, in terms of larger stories, like the story of where we are, we need ways to um, develop a different narrative of what values. So for example, this, and again, higher education should be at the forefront of this. If, if we let the definition of success in America be celebrity and making money, we're going to create a rat race that's going to get worse and worse. We have to develop different values that are really important, uh, like cooperation, like concern for the common good. It's like the Eau Claire is an example of that. Um, and that also begins to allow space to create a different, uh, different vision of the future in which different kinds of people can see themselves. Now it takes good organizing until Mike Huggins brought all the different parts of the community get together. People were in pretty much bubbles. I mean, the Hmong community was pretty separated from the mainstream old-time residents of Eau Claire, but working together and looking, doing a lot of projects together, they really develop working relationships. <coughs> Any other yeah, thoughts? I was, yeah. I was just wondering, uh, you know, we, we talk about... you got to speak up. up. Oh, sorry. We talk about cultivating values in other people's lives. How do we cultivate values in our own lives? Well, that's a really important question, and, and I think, again, um, it's useful to, to, to come back to nonviolence. So one of Martin Luther King's insights about nonviolence, and again, I think it should always be remembered, it may have come from Bayard Rustin. <laughs> so it wasn't just him thinking these things up. And also it may have come from seeing it in practice in the, in the maids who walked to work rather than take the bus or take segregated buses in, in Montgomery. Um, but Martin Luther King's uh, Fourth principle of nonviolence was nonviolence is transformative on the person. When one refuses to hate one's enemies, because if you hate, you're not ending hate, you're continuing and spreading hate. When you refuse to hate your enemies, when you ask, even, even if I hate what they're doing, it isn't hating the person, the first impact is on yourself. There's deep self-change. He said, <coughs> nonviolence first impacts the person who practices it. And it unleashes um, respect and strength and power that people never knew they had. And I saw that all across the South, which is why I really believe that we need to return to, and for the 21st century, nonviolence as a philosophy, not simply a tactic or a pacifism or something like that. That's, that would be my one answer I'd have. Sure, sure, sure. It's good to, if you, it's good to use a mic if you. Okay. 
Hi. Um, so my question was, for students who are interested in helping others to develop those skills and spaces that you talked about that empower individuals and their own ability to make change, and for those people in turn to be able to do what they want in terms of like creating additional social change, what are the key aspects of an experience that would give people that sustained interest to pursue their potential to act? Well, I think there are a couple of things. One is the, at a kind of entry level, the practice of, of uh, what we call civic deliberation. So this story from Denison of the women who organized a meeting on the party culture and its problems, but invited the fraternity leaders, so they would, that was a civic deliberation. But it was not just a chat, it was also aimed at coming up with some things we could do together. So that's the second thing. Uh, the, the best way to develop respect and relationships across differences is to do important projects together. Do real work together. Because you then learn that people had talents and capacities and insights and intelligence that you never imagined before. And we see that all the time. Um, now there's some other practices that are important in this, like a continuing process of reflecting on what worked, what didn't work. What did we learn from our failures? Another one is learning to be accountable to each other. In Public Achievement, the youth initiative, um, young people take on projects, um, K-12, or they're usually coached by college students, and they, they learn to be accountable to each other. So they, at the end of every meeting, every team meeting, they say, well, how are we doing? And if somebody said they were going to do something and they don't do it, then, you, then they other, it's the other kids calling them on the carpet. It's not some teacher or some older adult. Sometimes the coach helps, but it's mostly people learning accountability with each other. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to know how, so in the retail sphere in which people work as like cashiers and sales associates, how would we start moving away from efficiency and towards meaning without infringing on the concept and idea of good customer service, especially when a lot of our um, a lot of our job performance is determined by customer surveys and feedback. Um, there, there are a lot of dimensions of that. It's an important question. Um, I would think, first of all, um, it's really it's really good to supports small and locally owned businesses because they have a, a kind of feedback loops that the bigger chain stores don't necessarily have. Um, and I think one of the things that college students have done on some campuses is like create campaigns called Buy Local where you really strengthen the um, support systems for small businesses. Secondly, frankly, um, you know, robots and technology are not going to produce better customer service. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, it's, it's crazy making now that you can't get a real person on a telephone. That is not good customer service. It may be efficient, but it's not relational. So I think the point that needs to be constantly stressed <coughs> is that uh, customers, people you relate to in a business, are human beings, and, they, and, they, and the quality of the relationship is critically important. Stressing that, making it visible, getting s discussions. S uh, customer surveys are pretty thin ways of getting feedback. So if you can get a business to interact with customers in other ways, focus groups, for example, or conversations, it'll come out more vividly. But I think most people hate the way customer service is now being defined by, as robots. It's, it's, just, it's like an efficiency. It's like, it's, it's, it's a kind of business equivalent to thinking, the purpose of education is to fill kids' heads with knowledge. So if robots can do that more efficiently, you'll just get rid of the teachers. I mean, it's nonsense. Why is that the purpose of education? Why isn't education about developing many-sided, well-rounded people who can uh, create a more humane community and who can work with other people and who have the capacities for empathy and respect? and so I think, um, I think we, uh, central to this whole public work idea is the, the centrality of relationships. 
tied to the importance of purpose. That makes sense? It's just the beginning of a conversation. It's obviously a lot of angles to it. Um, well, I mean, those, that's a really good question. I, I don't think there's any, we, I don't think we can be naive. People are going to be nasty and brutal and self-interested and divisive. Um, and we need to call that out. But we need to do it in a way that's dignified and not demonizing. So, for example, a certain president can be really divisive and um, demonizing, but that doesn't mean we have to return in kind. Um, we can act with dignity and presence. The other thing that's really important is to find um, settings where people learn to talk things through and get a more uh, multidimensional view of things across different lines, and especially partisan lines. So I was delighted to hear that UNBC has a conversation between Democrats and Republicans about hot button topics. Um, there's a whole movement that's worth looking at um, called Better Angels. So it's about depolarizing people, and it has a whole skill set and how you learn to listen to people. Now, it's not at the level of listening to a politician spout off. It's learning to listen to people who are peers and in your environment. But um, their website is really good. It has a lot of stories of people learning to engage people who really think differently and understanding why. I mean, it's not only, say, conservatives who might have stereotypes. There's been a long history of people on the progressive side demonizing um, others, other people who they disagree with. Um, so I think it's kind of a kind of a two-track strategy here in a way. Is how do you deal with the craziness of the national culture, political culture, and the nastiness of it, and the divisiveness of it? <coughs> I mean, for one thing, I always do is recite the Serenity Prayer. You know. Focus on what you can do and what's real and what's close, to, close at hand. And um, don't get swept up in the kind of uh, hysteria of national politics. But the other thing is finding ways to really get to know people and interact with people who are different and who have different views. So before we close, I want to make sure that there's no more questions. Um, sorry. I'm curious that there's perhaps communities out there where the middle is shrinking. Uh, one of the ideas that's oftentimes popularized, I don't know how true it is, is that when you talk, when you, there's a conversation about economics, it always talks about the shrinking middle class. And I'm curious whether or not there's a shrinking sense of um, moderacy within the United States. So what moderates are there left to win over if that demographic is shrinking? And should the goal be to like get more moderates? Because I don't think it's a question of moderates exactly. For one thing, I don't think of myself as a moderate. I think of myself as believing in radical deep change. And I think actually a lot of people, most people think that a lot of things have to change. But the question of how you change things and how you go about interacting with other kinds of people is 
really central. Um, I would say the evidence is actually, I mean, it's only when you think in very narrow partisan categories and boxes do you say that the country is becoming more polarized. Actually, this, the evidence is that pe most people are very complex in their views. They don't fit easily into a narrow box. Um, and the best way to find that out is to do relational meetings and get to know people who are different. So again, if you look at the Better Angel site, it's full of stories of people who thought the other side were just demons incarnate, and they came to know them, and they developed different kind of relationships and different respect. And, um, and actually, that, that movement is built around starting with people who are kind of in the partisan boxes, the red and blue. That's a, most Better Angels meetings, workshops, forums involve equal number of Democrats and Republicans. They started that way with, uh, in, a, in rural Ohio with uh, equal number of Trump and, and Clinton supporters. But if, if it has a process of going through um, thinking about your own assumptions and your own stereotypes and thinking about how other people see you and then hearing each other talk about those things and actually what it, it really, if you look at even the opening video on the Vet Better Angels site out of, out of that first meeting, um, people really changed their views. They understood that, well, they actually most of the people said, ended up feeling that they were kind of purple rather than red versus blue. So I don't, I don't think we have the, many of those stories, but actually that's, that's the evidence. People, and also the other thing about Better Angels that's really important, um, to a person, the people who become really involved in this movement think that they've been manipulated. Their hatreds have been inflamed and manipulated and ex, uh, accentuated. So they see themselves as breaking the kind of outside forces which are manipulating and inflaming. And, and that's an accurate view because actually it's not only the Russians who are stirring up hatreds and divisions, it's like all the technologies that are used in modern politics. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. Good luck. I'm eager to see what happens at UMBC. And I really hope um, that the conversation we had last night about careers and career possibilities and becoming agents of change through your work, not simply as a volunteer, that's going to continue and deepen. That's, that would put UMBC at the cutting edge of democratic transformation in higher education.